So welcome everyone who's joining us. Um, we're looking forward to um, a new open lecture. We're just gonna wait uh, another couple of minutes because people are uh, still joining us. So uh, we'll just uh, wait for a minute or two, thank you. So welcome, this is a, an open lecture, um, which will start in a couple of minutes. You're very welcome, everyone who's joined us and we'll start in about one minute. Thank you very much and, and welcome to all our international uh, audience as well. Great to see you. Okay, I think we'll get started. So <clears throat> many thanks for joining us. Um, welcome to um, virtual uh, open lecture from the University, from the School of Education at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. I'm delighted to host uh, another of these lectures uh, for students, uh, for members of staff, uh, both at the University of Glasgow and internationally. And it's great to see so many participants from across the across the globe. So many, uh, many thanks for joining us. Uh, so good afternoon, good evening, and good, uh, great to see you all. So I'm delighted to, to introduce um, our lecturer today, who is going to <coughs> uh, give a, a presentation on systematic literature reviews in educational research. Uh, her title is um, Systematic Literature Review when to conduct one and how to do it. And I think that title is, is, is pretty, is very attractive to a lot of us uh, because uh, as students and also as members of staff, we, we, like, we need to do a, a rigorous um, literature review as part of our research or for our dissertation or study. So I think it's really important that we have someone who, who's carried out, conducted a systematic literature review herself um, to, to talk us through the steps. So I'll introduce um, Clara. <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Clara Bonavilla holds a PhD in sociology from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. She is currently a Margarita Salas postdoctoral research fellow at the um, Autonomous University of Barcelona and is with us at the University of Glasgow too. So we're delighted to have her with us, working with us. So she, she's working on a project on the political economy of large scale assessments in the global south. In the past, Clara has participated in different competitive research projects and has collaborated with various educational research organizations, including Education International, Open Society Foundations and UNESCO. Clara's research interests are market policies in education, comparative analysis of education reforms and education and international development. So I'm delighted that Clara has accepted uh, our invitation to give us a lecture on, um, on an area that she's studied herself and developed. So I'm going to hand over to you, Clara. Um, just to say, there's, before we start, there's a Q&A um, button. Please, we welcome questions. We're going to have a a Q&A uh, after the talk, after the presentation for about 10 or 15 minutes. So please uh, 
put some questions that we could deal with uh, after, after Clara's presentation. So with no further ado, I'll let Clara take over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, and thanks all of you for joining us. Uh, I'm not sure if to say uh, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, but yeah, since we are in Scotland, good afternoon, probably. So it's a pleasure to be here today. And over yeah, the next minutes, I will do my best to present a little bit what is all the foods with systematic literature reviews and especially how to do, how to conduct one of them. So um, yeah, let me share my screen. I hope yeah, everyone can see it. Fine, let me know if this is not the case. So as this title very subtly suggests, um, this presentation um, revolves around the re research methods called systematic literature reviews. And uh, what I will do is I, I have organized this presentation in two main parts. First of all, I will introduce the a sort of very basic definition of what is and what is not a systematic literature review, but especially why it is useful and when we should or we could conduct one. And then I will focus on the mechanics, let's say, of systematic literature reviews. So giving very basic, um, practically oriented pointers about yeah, how to do one step by a step. Of course, this will be necessarily superficial, but um, yeah, I'm happy to respond to questions or further clarification in the Q&A. And of course, as you know, um, I'm always available for a chat or an email. So uh, without further ado, what are systematic literature reviews? Um, this is a curious method because on the one hand is a little bit the bread and butter of all researchers. So we all at some point have to conduct some sort of at least rigorous literature review. And at the same time, it's one of the less discussed methods. It is assumed that maybe we all know how to do one um, and it's not considered a particularly sophisticated or fancy method. So yeah, dealing with uh, this, uh, I'm gonna try to clarify a little bit some conception about what is, why are they useful or necessary systematic literature reviews. So the a classical, let's say, and quite succinct definition of systematic literature reviews is that systematic literature reviews are a review um, that uses systematic and explicit and accountable methods. So, um, yeah, that would be like the most basic definition. The key characteristics I would like to emphasize. So what is so special about systematic literature review? Well, I would say that the most distinct characteristic is that unless any other form of literature review, it relies on a transparent and explicit method oriented at avoiding bias. So it's not simply reading and picking a source here, another author there, but trying to get a comprehensive overview of what has been said on a specific theme on the basic of a, on, of a rigorous and explicit method. So there is this emphasis on method, methodological rigor, methodological scrutiny. However, this is still is kind of vague, and there are other research methods that I would say that are close to systematic literature reviews. Uh, first of all, quite common is the literature mapping. This is a classical exercise we do, I would say, our researchers all the time, which is basically oriented at trying to chart the state of the art of a specific theme with a broadly defined question, and basically uh, through the identification of key concepts, key authors, key school of thoughts, and the like. This is not exactly systematic literature review because it lacks this uh, systematic or accountable transparent components. So the methodological rigor. Then we have a scoping reviews. A scoping reviews are quite rigorous in terms of methods uh, and um, selection protocols, just as systematic literature reviews, but unlike systematic literature reviews, they are more superficial and they typically are oriented at uh, quickly mapping yeah, the volume and the scope of what has been published on a field and describing the research, but not necessarily analyzing. So they are not oriented at making an original contribution, but simply at charting the, the field uh, of a certain area in a more or less systematic way. Anyway, um, I, don't, I do not want to insist on the minor difference between different forms of systematic literature reviews, but that would be a little bit the big picture. So I think that sometimes, um, Part of the difficulty of defining systematic literature reviews has to do with the fact that there are, there are a lot of misconceptions because in a way we have all 
heard about systematic literature reviews, but maybe sometimes you get some cliches, uh, problematic uh, ideas. So a, a common one I would say, and one that I used to, fact, uh, to have, is that systematic literature reviews are just like an ordinary review, but larger, so with more papers. Of course, uh, as I was commenting before, this is not the case because the idea, the key attribute is methodological scrutiny, transparency in the way we conduct it. So they can even be smaller than a classical review that we do for a thesis or whatever. But yeah, it's a, the, um, it's a matter of rigor. Um, at some point, and basically because the origin of systematic literature reviews can be found in uh, medicine, natural sciences, there are sometimes there is the idea that systematic literature reviews can only include a specific sort of studies, typically randomized controlled trials. This is really not the case. So a systematic literature review can be can encompass can include qualitative, quantitative studies. There is no sort of uh, barrier in terms of what can be included in a systematic literature review. Another common misconception I would say is that they are yeah, like a fallback option, a low, the easiest way um, that anyone can do it, that is a quick exercise. Well, um, as with any research methods, this is not the case, but in fact, a good systematic literature review requires um, fine tuning or developing certain skills. So uh, it requires some reflection. And, and on the other side of the spectrum, there are also those that think that systematic literature reviews can only be conducted by um, systematic literature review experts. Again, this is not the case. I would say that is one of the research methods we all can become good at. So having maybe clarified this, why are they useful or in what circumstances we can consider conducting a systematic literature review? Basically, they are useful when we need or want to make sense and clarify large bodies of information. And why would we want to clarify large bodies of information? First of all, if we have, a, let's say, practical orientation as policy makers, as practitioners, as teachers, I would say that a, a very basic motivation is trying to understand what works and what not, what policy work, what pedagogical intervention work, and which one are not a good idea. But also they are useful if we want to, let's say, clarify areas of uncertainty. This kind of areas in which much has been published, but there is a lot of noise. So we are not clear about, yeah, what can we trust? What are the consensus? What are the areas for disagreement and so on? And finally, they are also useful to highlight and signal that in fact, certain areas that we think that uh, are consensual are in fact still ambiguous and inconclusive in terms of the research that has been produced. So at the end of the day, I would say that they are useful because it allows us as researchers, as policymakers, as practitioners involved in different parts of the education system, it allows us to first, um, evaluate if certain areas are, are worth trying. So if it's worth trying a pilot and so on, uh, making sense of conflicting evidence, which is quite common, this situation reduced by us, especially when it comes to politicized uh, questions, uh, questions around which the, there is a lot of ideological heat, uh, heated discussion and so on. It's a good idea to try to reduce by us, understand where is people speaking from, and basically deal with information overload, which is a common ill of our times. But yeah, uh, I would say that the main advantage is that, um, as the saying goes, and don't put all your eggs in, in the same basket, is that um, it allows us to diversify our sources and sources and make sure that, yeah, we are uh, having getting the big picture of what has been said on a certain theme. So examples of situations uh, close to the, the, to the education research field in which it is useful. Areas in which there is uncertainty or even conflicting claims, classical one. Um, to what extent privately subsidized education can help or improve the performance of socially disadvantaged students. This is the kind of area in which you will have arguments in favor and against. So it's useful to try to clarify what has been said and on the basis of what kind of evidence. Also, when we uh, are in, let's say, in, a, in the need to develop a new pedagogical intervention, a new policy, and we don't know exactly where to head up. For instance, in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemics, we needed to figure out uh, to what extent or what kind of online learning approaches were more useful. So it was a good idea, I would say, to try to clarify what had been had been published until the moment about yeah, the most productive or um, cost-effective online learning approaches. Also, when 
we have an area in which there is a lot of information, but there are some key gaps that still remain to be answered. For instance, there is a lot published on the effect of uh, performance based uh, salary bonus for teachers, but we are still unclear on which is the exit mechanism that uh, enables these bonuses to improve motivation. So this is an area that yeah probably would require some, some sort of systematic literature review. And uh, yeah, when we have more or less the overall teacher, but we need to find new research direction, figure out new research agendas, as for instance, in the case of early school living, this has been a very well studied, uh, yeah, um, an intensively studied theme, but still we need to figure out which should be the next research directions. So yeah, having said these examples, I would say that the most complicated part of systematic literature reviews it's not so much identifying the theme or the topic we are interested about, but framing the question in a way that it's useful and lends itself to the purposes of a systematic literature review. And here, as always, boundaries matter because the, let's say, the difficulty is to find a strike and equilibrium between a too big or a too narrow question. So I have tried to yeah, put an example of a fictitious systematic literature review, but let's imagine that we are interested in yeah, understanding um, how how does work related stress work among primary school teachers. This theme as such is very difficult. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to the purpose of a systematic literature review because there is no clear question. So we will find a lot of studies that we will not have key, clear criteria to select them and so on. Of course, we could go to the other end of the spectrum and end up with a super narrow question like, okay, how a certain policy, anti-bullying protocols, affect uh, the stress levels of teachers in London? This is too specific for a systematic literature review, basically, because there are not so many studies published on this, so what's the use? So, and in between, let's say, would be the kind of questions that are uh, highlighted in green in the, in the slide. So, what are the key determinants of teacher stress? Which theories have been used to understand teacher stress? What kind of policy interventions in different countries have proven successful in reducing teacher stress? Uh, yeah, this kind of stuff. Again, uh, there is no blueprint for this and there is no one size fits all uh, kind of question. But yeah, I would always encourage the students to try to find this balance between two big or too narrow questions and try to focus on this kind of middle range or middle ground questions. Um, and of course, before conducting a systematic literature review, it's always useful to consider if maybe there is already another good systematic literature review published and how our systematic literature review can contribute to this area of uh, research. So um, I would also like to clarify that sometimes people perceive, as I was commenting before, systematic literature reviews as some, as a, some sort of second best or fallback option. Um, but in fact, um, and I always emphasize this point, systematic literature reviews are the research method in, in their own, in, in their own right. So for certain research questions, they are simply the way to go. And it's also useful to remember that they can be combined with uh, other methods oriented at the collection of primary data. And in any case, they are, in any research I would say, a useful, uh, maybe not necessary, but at least useful a step in any inquiry. First of all, because it's good to get an overview of what has already been published. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. And especially because if we are uh, trying to collect primary data of individuals, as is typically the case of education research, we need to do our homework and to prepare our work before going to the field and um, asking people for their time. So it's also a matter of, I would say, personal responsibility. Make sure that you know your staff and your literature before starting to post questions and let's say, yeah, uh, bother people with your questions. So I would say that they are not really uh, second best, but in fact, a key part of uh, any kind of research. And finally, to, uh, to finish this more introductory section. Of course, not all systematic literature reviews uh, are born uh, equal, but I would say that they can be classified in two main groups. First of all, we have aggregative re reviews. I would say that, that this, has, um, this is the kind of more popular systematic literature review. Classical study that, let's say, summarizes in a quantitative, quantitative way the result of different intervention. So typically, they are oriented at um, proving or testing an hypothesis, like 
uh, as I was saying before, do uh, performance-based salary bonus increase uh, teachers' performance? This is a question of yes or no, and we can provide a figure like, yeah, on an average, they increase teachers' motivation by 15%. I don't know. I am doing a sort of simplification, but these aggregative systematic literature reviews are the ones oriented at responding these kind of questions. So they focus on comparability. They will uh, aim at exhaustiveness. They want to add all the studies published around the certain questions and let's say, find the, the average response. But then we have also configurative literature reviews that I would say that uh, they are the typical ones that are necessary for uh, master thesis and the like. These are reviews that combine qualitative or quantitative data, maybe, or that uh, do not have uh, yeah, a clear boundary or any kind of limitation regarding the studies that uh, they can include. And rather than being oriented at testing an hypothesis, rather than being deductive in nature, they follow an inductive design. So they, they are oriented at kind of generating theory and new insights on a given theme. So they allow us to explore and reorganize the field in a way that is useful for our research purposes. So they basically try to uh, understand heterogeneity in a given uh, feel or topic. So what are the different points of view? What has been said from different disciplines for different uh, from different angles and so on? And typically, they are um, more time uh, consuming because it they have an iterative nature. Uh, nature, it means constantly revisiting what has been published. But yeah, I would say that they are uh, more common, maybe less fancy, but they are the kind of ones that are more useful for, yeah, for the purposes of um, PhD or master dissertations and so on. So going back, for instance, to the example of teachers bonuses, a configurative review on the effect of teachers bonuses would not ask who, uh, to what extent um, performance based bonus improve teachers performance, but would rather ask through which mechanisms uh, performance based bonus translating uh, higher motivation for teachers. Uh, it is because peer pressure, it's, it is because leaving and shaming dynamics, it is because uh, the impact on self-image, this kind of thing. So it would be oriented at understanding the mechanisms, the nuts and bolts of the connection between um, performance weights, bonuses, and motivation, rather than simply provide a figure about yeah, to what extent there is a connection between them. I'm not sure um, if this is clear, if there are questions, or I'm also happy to respond them uh, now before uh, entering in the more um, hands-on approach or um, the practically oriented part of the session. Um, since I believe um, this is not the case, let me check the chat. Um, yeah. uh, 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 uh. Okay. I, um, I can see that there is a question regarding this first uh, part, and because I think it is relevant, maybe I would deal with it now. So, uh, um, okay, the relation between systematic and exhaustive. Yeah, systematic doesn't mean necessarily exhaustive. I would say that exhaustiveness is truly an impossibility, but there is at least an attempt at exhaustiveness and an avoiding bias. So maybe you don't need to read exactly everything that has been published on a theme, but you should for sure, try to avoid that you are not concentrating too much on a certain angle. So if you are dealing, yeah, again, with uh, the determinants of um, uh, teacher stress, you have to make sure that you are not focusing exclusively on literature from psychological sciences and forgetting literature from sociological sciences, for instance. So maybe you don't need to read everything. You, you cannot really be exhaustive, but at least you should be systematic and uh, avoid bias. Um, if this if this helps, so okay. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay, so how to conduct one? Um, in this second section, I would focus on the mechanics. So simply to give a bit of an overview, and I know that the figure uh, looks overly complicated, but it is not. I have tried to capture what are the classical or standard steps or stages in a systematic literature review. So as we were commenting before, the first one is try to identify if there is a need for a systematic literature review and how we should frame it, which is the topic, what interest it is. 
in and how we should frame our questions. So finding this equilibrium between narrow and uh, big questions and so on, and understanding what motivates us to do this research. So what kind of literature we are interested in finding. And it is on the basis on this that we should define what uh, are called inclusion criteria. So the kind of search terms or keywords we are interested in retrieving literature about. On the basis of these uh, search terms or keywords, we will uh, conduct the first searches of primary studies. So trying to compile everything that might potentially be of interest for our systematic literature review. And when we have compiled all the potential interesting literature, we will screen each one of the papers against uh, inclusion criteria that we have been discussing before. So considering questions of quality, research quality, if they are rigorous enough for our purposes and relevance, if there is a clear topical fit um, connection between our interest uh, in the systematic literature review and the object uh, of the of a specific paper and on the basis of this further screening we need for each paper to extract the data that is more interesting for us for our research question papers as you know deal with a lot of things so we need to find a way of extracting only the relevant information for the purposes of our research question and finally synthesizing the data as you can see with the arrow that yeah, connects the data extraction and the search for primary studies, this very frequently is a sort of back and forth process uh, in the sense that um, it has to be repeated um, different on different occasions, basically because when you conduct the first search for primary studies assessment, sometimes you realize that maybe there is a gap, something that you have been missing. So you have to identify new search terms or keywords, search again for additional papers and make sure that yeah, you are not forgetting anything, any discipline, any angle, um, any uh, vocabulary that is used to discuss a certain theme and that maybe we were not familiar, so we were not able to identify uh, all the necessary keywords and so on. So it is an iterative process and requires some back and forth. This is why this is not uh, sometimes such a straight uh, forward method or such a rapid method as some people expect or would like. So I know that uh, typically when we plan our um, masters or even PhD thesis, we try to rush through the, through the literature review stage and maybe through the systematic literature review stage because yeah, it seems boring and it seems relatively straightforward but i would say that doing it um, with the necessary time and allowing ourselves to um, uh, follow this iterative design is a way to make sure that yeah our final product the kind of thing we are getting from a systematic literature review is interesting is a is in itself a contribution to the literature so yeah we have uh, to allow us ourselves to have the necessary time to conduct um, these stages uh, as many times as needed so, okay, go, uh, I will now explain a little bit about what is this, uh, all the fuss with inclusion criteria. Basically, we are talking here about keywords, the kind of keywords we will then look for in academic databases, repositories, and so on. Again, here we always have the, let's say, dilemma, or uh, we have to find an equilibrium between restricted and loose approaches. We have to be able to come out with a list of keywords that capture and are related to our research question, but they cannot include everything. Otherwise, we will end up with thousands of papers. So yeah, try to find an equilibrium. And more importantly, I would say, make sure, especially when we are dealing with policy-related themes and so on, that we avoid um, or compensate for the presence of politically or ideologically charged concepts. We know um, yeah, that uh, sometimes the way we talk about an issue is in itself a way uh, or heads ourselves in a certain direction. So yeah, make sure that we are not using, let's say biased vocabulary in our definition of inclusion terms. And other criteria beyond the uh, mm, search terms or keywords, other criteria to take into account is that we can decide on a time frame that is for our interest. For instance, if I am interested in understanding, um, yeah, what are the, which is the uh, online learning method more useful for uh, disadvantage, disadvantaged students, maybe I don't need to go back to research conducted in the 90s because this was, I would say, in the early days of, um, 
computer mediated learning so maybe we don't we do not need to uh, get an overview of what of the 90s methods are useful for this kind of a student maybe we can um, let's say select a shorter time frame focused on research uh, on the let's say last decade right and again in terms of language here is simply a matter of being realistic we have to uh, be brave maybe not to um, let's say only focus on English but we cannot uh, select languages we do not understand for obvious reasons and then another option and I would typically recommend this is that we focus on a specific education level um, and so on because otherwise again it's easy to end up with thousands and thousands of papers so sometimes for instance if I'm interest, interested in the effects of private education maybe I need to get rid of uh, higher education because it's a whole different story and maybe I can focus on basic education in, we, in which yeah, it's more likely to, to end up with a manageable uh, amount or volume of papers. But in any case, again, there is no magic, um, there is no receipt, there is no blueprint for this. And there is this element of a back and forth when trying to identify our inclusion criteria, the kind of criteria that we will use to uh, look for papers. And then where to look for papers? So where should we be finding this literature? Well, I don't know how you typically do your researches when it comes to university related stuff. I would say that most of people these days go first to Google a scholar because it's quite comprehensive. It uh, yeah, encompasses mostly everything that has been published. But still, I would encourage you to rely on academic repositories like Scopus and Web of Science, with, which are quite good in terms of um, education related publications. And why? Well, because this kind of academic databases or repositories allow us to conduct advanced searches. So they allow us to refine uh, our searches in a more sophisticated way. And it is a way of avoiding ending up with thousands and thousands of papers because we can use this language related criteria, discipline related criteria, uh, time frame criteria, and so on. But then I would say that for most of the potential research questions of systematic literature review, we should not rely exclusively on academic databases, but we should also consider other sources. First of all, great literature, so the typical reports, um, policy briefs, the kind of stuff produced by governments or uh, NGOs, third sector organizations that very frequently have built with certain education intervention, pedagogical practices, and so on. This kind of gray literature is not always indexed in these electronic databases we are commenting. So it is useful to go to the um, organizational repositories of key organizations in our field, right? And then, because yeah, we can, you can, you're never 100% um, sure of you have, if you have everything, I would also recommend to conduct some basic hand searches in Google, selected websites that we kind of trust, specialized, specialized journals, especially if we want to capture uh, literature that is not published in English. So what happens with the databases and academic repositories I was commenting is that there is a certain uh, clear overrepresentation of um, research published in English. So if we want to include uh, literature from different areas and so on, we should probably be looking on a specialized, uh, specialized journals yeah, in different languages. And finally, another, I would say, uh, trick or recommendation I would have is to compile a very basic list of key informants, people that are experts in our field whether for thematic reasons or for as a reason of their geographic expertise. So let's say that, yeah, I'm interested in uh, online learning, but I want to understand how it is being done in South, in, in China. Maybe I need to contact someone with an expertise on yeah, the Chinese sphere. So, and we can have um, this list of key informants and maybe contact them to, yeah, to ask uh, which are, according to you, the three most important sources about this theme. And sometimes you have surprises. You find literature that you had not identified through electronic databases, maybe because it is a book and so on, uh, and that are a good contribution to our systematic literature review. So this would be the data sources. Um, yeah, um, when it comes, in any case, to academic data sources, when I was commenting about this advanced search feature, what, what do I refer to? Well, um, 
sources like Scopus or the Web of Science allow us to create these syntaxes. So this is a kind of kind of complex list of key search terms that allow us to use Boolean operators. So you can ask that um, you want um, to make sure that two key terms appear, uh, one close to another. Uh, you may uh, you can ask to avoid certain um, keywords and so on. They are also they also allow us to use wildcards. So yeah, uh, substituting single characters. Here we have the American versus British uh, spelling difference and so on. So it's a good deal of willing with this. The wild card wild cards uh, allowed by uh, Scopus or Web of Science. And also it is a way of conducting a sort of preliminary search, making sure that we are on track. So uh, as I will explain, when we conduct a search with a Scopus or Web of Science, you can ask for a quick overview of the documents according to the most common authors. And I would say that this is useful because if you are not sure if our list of keywords is aligned to our needs, maybe we can uh, try to understand, okay, what kind of uh, literature I am retrieving? What are the most common authors in this literature? If the authors ring a bell, we are already familiar with them, we are probably on the right track. If we see some strange authors we had never heard about, two options. Maybe, yes, we are discovering new themes, or maybe our list of keywords is not good enough and is retrieving information from another academic debate that it is not in our interest. So this is another of the features of the Web of Science or the Scopus repositories that cannot be found in Google Scholar, for instance. Also, Scopus and the Web of Science allow us to use exclusion criteria. So yeah, we select certain disciplines. For instance, I would say that in most of the searches I have conducted in the past, there are, for some reason, always a lot of medical related literature. If Even if I don't understand, on the basis of which keywords, but they keep appearing. So you can simply deselect all the literature published in medical journals. And it is a way of, again, simplifying the, or reducing the volume of papers you are collecting. And yeah, uh, and the use of analysis uh, features to make sure we are on the right track. So, okay, when we have compiled this list of potentially interesting papers on the basis of the inclusion criteria we have defined it, and on the basis of different sources, different web pages, different repositories. What do we do with our first, um, let's say, batch of papers? How should we um, decide if we keep them and use them for, for the systematic literature review, or if we get rid of them, we discard them because they are not useful? Well, I would say that it's useful to conduct, first of all, a very um, superficial screening on the basis of the title. It is a way of uh, reducing a lot the volume of our um, batch of papers, basically because, yeah, um, in many of the cases with the title, you can uh, decide quite quickly if this is more or less aligned to your thematic uh, focus. And then do a second screening on the basis of the abstract, again, to see if there is a clear thematic fit. But that's not all. So basically, when we have conducted this initial screening, we end up with a more or less manageable volume of papers that have a clear thematic fit with our research question. But that should not be all. We need to um, screen these studies, these primary studies, according to quality and relevance criteria. Here again, there is no um, blueprint. Uh, there is mm, not a universal receipt to do this. But I would say that it is useful that in the interest and in the sake of transparency to write for ourselves a list of criteria about yeah, how are we going to decide if a given paper is, has a low, medium or high validity, uh, internal, external validity. So if it has the necessary quality to be introduced in our systematic literature review to discard this kind of shoddy studies that sometimes make their way into academic repositories. And then again, a clear criteria to decide to what extent these studies are relevant. And if we, again, finally decide to discard them because they are not, are not directly responding to our research question and so on. And of course, we could do this kind of exercise without writing down the criteria, but it's a good exercise and it's a way of avoiding bias. It's a way of being systematic to note down what will be our criteria. This is an example, for instance, of a criteria we kind of invented for the purposes of a systematic literature review on education privatization experiences. So we try to compile a list of uh, a checklist of what we considered acceptable in terms of quality and what we considered 
in acceptable and the same for relevance. So again, this is another opportunity to reduce the, um, the volume of your uh, first batch of primary studies. So, okay, when we have finally uh, more or less manageable uh, volume of primary studies and we are sure that the ones we have are, have the necessary quality and have a clear thematic fit, what should we do with them? Here I would say it's another of the tricky parts of systematic literature reviews because we need a way of extracting the key information for each paper in a more or less cost-effective way and in a way that makes them easy to analyze the resulting data. I would typically recommend to devise some sort of extraction sheet uh, or extraction record on the, basis, uh, on the basis of our research questions. So if we're interested, for instance, in the case of um, education privatization reforms, if we want to understand uh, in which context they are more likely to uh, unfold, which are the typically actors involved, and yeah, what um, policy mechanism explain then uh, adoption, we need basically to create an extraction sheet with these three fields and read each paper and um, introduce the relevant information in, uh, in, the, in our extraction record. But again, there is no, uh, here is very difficult to give pointers in any sense because it all depends on re your research question. When it comes to um, aggregative reviews, the ones more oriented to capture only quantitative studies that I was commenting before, I would say that another way to go is to classify papers according if they find a positive, neutral, or negative impact of a given pedagogical or policy intervention. It is a way, again, of dealing with complexity in a quite a manageable way. But this basically is useful if you are testing an hypothesis and yeah, you, are, you can, readily classify papers according to these three um, axes. Otherwise, things get complicated and yeah, you need again some back and forth, try different extraction sheets if they are useful for our for your purposes. And then when you have compiled, I would say, all the extraction sheets for all the papers you are including in your literature review, you can have a first read, see if you are missing something important, maybe conduct some additional um, searches yeah, to um, complement, uh, to yeah, incorporate, include, uh, include other streams of research and so on. And yeah, after you have maybe conducted this process as many times as needed, you simply, simply need to make sure to find a way of uh, organizing this information in a way that it is interesting for the reader. So signaling areas of consensus, areas of disagreement, uh, key contributions and so on. Anyway, I would say that, yeah, this is a, a, a bit of a very quick and very superficial overview of how to do it. Um, then again, as a disclaimer, it's difficult to give a one size fits all receipt. But yeah, I would say at least that these are the standard uh, steps in a systematic literature review and some of the basic do's and don'ts that would be shared by most experts on systematic literature reviews. But if we want to know more, um, these are a couple of, I would say, very good and comprehensive and plain in a, uh, written in a plain language sources. And yeah, and I can give more recommendation if someone needs them or is interested. And yes, having, I mean, said that, um, there is now maybe some time for questions, uh, yeah, there's a need for the clarification, criticisms. So. Clara, thank you so much. Um, you, you managed to get through so much in, in, in the short time period, and uh, I think you covered a lot of the, the, the important steps that we need to take in order to, to carry out a, a rigorous uh, literature review. So some really, um, really helpful um, contributions. Uh, as you can see, we've got a few questions and, and uh, we probably don't have time to do all of them, but uh, perhaps we could look at, I think there was one question about, um, uh, I wonder if it's possible to conduct a fully qualitative um, literature SR um, I see there's specific type for pure quantitative, so wondering if we could approach it from a pure qualitative perspective. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I would say, I mean, some of the best systematic literature reviews I have read dealt basically with qualitative studies. Um, and I would say that precisely when it comes to qualitative research, there is a lot of room for simplification, for distilling the key ideas. So, for instance, um, 
very frequently in the education field, qualitative studies are able to devise mechanisms that explain the connection between two uh, uh, variables, right? For instance, yes, we know um, there is a lot of literature, uh, I, would, I don't know, on how um, the lack of uh, attention in the school might end up uh, favoring early school living and so on. Okay, and we have plenty of literature discussing the exact mechanisms, the exact process through which this occurs with interviews with early school leavers and so on. Okay, but maybe here is an opportunity for a systematic literature review to maybe end up with a simplified list of mechanisms that explain the um, stereotypes among teachers and early school living. So what is exactly happening? What are the th main pathways connecting the two things? So yeah, definitely I would say that, that there is um, no inconvenient at all. On the contrary, it's one of the areas in which it's useful to make this effort, the, the exercise to simplify information, to deal with information overload because yeah, as qualitative researchers can write a lot about things with many examples, the lived experience, and sometimes there is need to systematize the thing, saying, okay, but what is common across different qualitative studies, what is new, what is unusual, and so on. So, yeah, I would say that definitely. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, there's an interesting question from Sanjana about comparing theories of policies, which type would you go, would this go? Yeah, um, no, that's an systematic. excellent one. I would say that this is cl cl clearly, clearly the realm of configurative reviews. And it is a very useful exercise because yeah, sometimes there is a lot of written about the ethics of the policy, but it's interesting to understand, okay, which are the principles, the theories of change, the tenets orient, um, orienting policies or the theories behind the policy. So yeah, I would say that it, it is useful. For instance, I don't know, uh, there are a lot of uh, policies oriented at, uh, yeah, um, you know, um, establishing quotas for university attendance in certain countries. Yeah, you need to make sure that in the university there is at least a percentage of indigenous people and so on. Okay, there is a lot of papers about this, but sometimes it is useful to try to understand which are the principles, the assumptions on which these policies rely. And here, a systematic literature review is a good way of dealing with this. Not sure if I'm responding to your question, Sanjana. I think that, no, I think that's helpful. No, I think that's very helpful. Uh, just quickly, because time is going, is that uh, Liana is doing her PhD on exploring students' exper parents' experiences of post-school transition from special schools, really interesting topic. Uh, mixed, she's using mixed method design, but she's having problems where a systematic review would fit in her research. And she's, she's got four questions, which are for research, but how do I go about writing a question for a systematic review? She's put yeah. a particular question, which is quite specific. I, yeah, in terms of that's quite a, a detailed question, quite a lot a lot in there yeah. yeah i mean uh in honestly i'm not maybe sufficiently familiar with the theme but i think mm. that yeah you are in in the right track i would say but maybe trying to frame it about okay uh what do you mean by roles and experience um so in in which ways the uh, role and experience of teachers make a difference so maybe trying to be a bit more specific on what exactly do you want to capture yeah. about this role as an experience. Maybe I'm, it's simply because I'm not familiar, but yeah, I think that for the general question that orients your research, it is useful to conduct a literature review to, yeah, to understand what has been said on the impact mm -hmm. uh, of the, yeah, the roles of teachers, parents, and the students in this post-school uh, transitions in a special education. So yeah, what has been published about this, I'm sure that a lot, so maybe trying to systematize the main points, areas of consensus, so. Yeah, no, that's useful, I, yeah. Um, so moving on, uh, just to one more question. Someone liked your trick-or-treat image for the Boolean search, that was great, the, the Halloween one. <laughs> um, so. Oh. In the right. standard stages slide, search of primary studies is mentioned. So I would say that, yeah, it's a very good question. It is not in my uh, nice uh, figure, but I would say that it should be in the first stage. So, okay, I have this question, this interest, quick search, has a systematic literature review already been done or maybe asking around? So, yes. Um, yeah, I think that we have to make sure that we know about 
uh, relevant literature reviews at the very start. But if we find them in a later stage for any reason, we can still include it as part of our uh, batch of primary studies, definitely. So we cannot ignore them, um, that for sure. But yeah, I would say that it's more useful if we identify them in the first step, basically because sometimes then you think, okay, I maybe I do not need to conduct a systematic literature review, or I have to tweak my research question in, or, in order to make sure that it is a new contribution rather than re replicating what other people has has done. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Uh, maybe just one last one in Mayam in aggregative research approach. Should all the included article articles have the same methodology? Mm, not necessarily exactly the same methodology, but but yeah, I would. For instance, recommend that yeah, if you are comparing experimental designs, you focus on experimental designs. If you are going for survey-based designs, focus on this. Otherwise, things get uh, a little bit tricky and shady. I would say that not 100% the same methodology, but yeah, maybe at least the same empirical design in broadly defined terms. So yeah, that there is a, a little bit of an equivalence. Brilliant. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop there. I, I think one thing I, I just wanted to point out is the time factor is that um, we often underestimate how long it takes to do this type of work, uh, particularly when we're planning to do um, a literature review and then carry out an actual intervention or a study. So, you know, there is no sort of set time, but I found it could take several months to do properly. What do you think? Uh, what's your yeah. opinion? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely several months. I think that it's not uncommon at all. Uh, so yeah, take your time, but also enjoy the process because I, I know when I talk to students, they all want to rush over the thing, but you learn a lot and you typically refine your own ideas. I think that we are you become a much better researcher in a quite cost-effective way by doing this. But yeah, and there are systematic literature reviews that take years. Uh, I mean, in, in one particular case in which there is a lot of information overload about the role of private subsidized education, I think that it took us two years to a team of three researchers. Yes. It's not the only thing we're doing, but yeah, it takes some time and it's better not to underestimate and to enjoy the process. Um, Absolutely, to do it. Yeah, I recently did one. It took us eight months to to reach, uh, to actually write the final report. And that was, that was working, for, you know, with a full-time research uh, research associate as well, so it is it is an investment, and uh, you know, don't it's not something to to think we could do in in a week. It's mm. it, it needs to be carefully thought out. Fantastic. Well, I'd, I'd just like to thank you so much, Cara. Um, we really had a an excellent presentation. There's lots of thanks in in the chat for your your great work. We've got the recording, and we can share that with uh, with with our participants. It uh, just leads me to, to advertise. Um, we've got two more excellent presentations coming up. Um, we've got Dr. Giovanna Facetta, who's going to be presenting on the 13th of April. And she's going to be looking at um, using photography in research with children and young people. So she's going to be looking at um, the use of visual methods to collect data in qualitative data, in qualitative research. So that's one. To look forward to and then in on the 18th of may um dr yvonne skipper is going to do a, a workshop uh, sorry a presentation called white water rights using creative writing as a research method and uh, yvonne has done this fantastic work in giving groups of people children and adults the opportunity to collaborate writing and publishing a full length novel in just one week. So that is quite <laughs> spectacular. And I've seen some fantastic results. Uh, and so she's gonna talk about the methodology, the whole process of how they started from the inception, from the conceptualization right through to publishing um, and getting it out as a published on Amazon and other, other um, platforms. So those are, um, we can post, um, I'm just seeing if uh, Natalie could, are, are you able to post the um, uh, the URL for our next two 
public uh, our next two presentations before we finish. Um, I already have. Oh, thank you so much. Sorry. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So it just leaves me uh, now to, to thank everyone. Thank you, Natalie, for organizing uh, the, the, this great webinar. And uh, very thanks to Clara uh, for a fantastic um, lecture, open lecture. And to all of you who joined us uh, this afternoon and this evening. So I just wish you um, uh, a great rest of the day or night. And let's, hope, let's all meet up in about a month's time on the 13th of April. Thank you very much and goodbye.